Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 106, The Ebb and Flow of Sherlock Holmes. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Oh, Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Ah, the dulcet tones of the ukulele lead us in. <laughs> oh, I guess, well, I'm, I got to snap out of it here. Hi, and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. Yes, and I'm Bert Wolder, and I like that, that uh, those pineapples on that shirt. That's just so attractive. Is that silk screening or are those embroidered? Oh, those are embroidered, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't bring it out, but I have a deer stalker to match. <laughs> the, the tropical weight wool deer stalker with, uh, with Hawaiian print. Uh, yeah. it's, it's the way to go. It's, 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 it's what everyone's wearing well, I'm in Hawaii so, these days. I'm so pleased you were in Hawaii, but let me ask you a question. Do, mm. you, do you have to wear those sunglasses indoors? I mean, that's really annoying. Well, I, I was trying not to be recognized. <laughs> I, how could you possibly not be recognized? Everywhere you go, you say, I'm Scott Monty. Well, let me tell you, when, when you wear sunglasses around inside, even at night, uh, <laughs> your, your wife tends to distance herself from you. So <laughs> there's no, no being recognized by anyone. That's uh, right. That, uh, it was a wonderful trip. Uh, I'm glad to be back, but I was glad we got to get a show out during the, during the, uh, the vacation time. Yeah. Yeah, that worked out well. Vacation? You mean you had vacation? I thought you were in business. You were just just racking up uh, more revenue in Hawaii. Well, hey, the, the the beauty of my work is I can do it from virtually anywhere. Oh, I like that. I can do it virtually from anywhere. Oh, I love that. Either way. Well, we're not here to talk about my vacation or business or any of that. We're here to talk about Sherlock Holmes. Oh, I've heard of him. Have you? Yes. <laughs> everywhere. We hear of him absolutely everywhere. Mm. And with that, one of the places that you absolutely will hear about Sherlock Holmes is from, why, one of these guys, our sponsors. When the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex was invaded by the Danes in 871, King Alfred the Great had to pay them to leave. That's why securing your borders is more important than ever, even if you don't own a rooming house. Yes, we can learn a lot from the past, and now you can look back to the first six months of 1893, when Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle were all the rage. In your copy of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the Newspapers, Volume 2, from the Wessex Press where you'll chart the rise and fall of Conan Doyle and J.M. Barry's comic opera Jane Annie and see Sherlock Holmes begin to achieve literary and cultural immortality. All for a modest twenty-eight ninety-five. Friends, the trees are in their autumn beauty and the woodland paths are dry. 
on this fall afternoon. Reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Ah, the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex. (laughs) I never tire of that place. No, it's a great place. You know, we should offer uh, an I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere tour <laughs> the, to the ancient land. Yeah, we think should. That, think that's doable? We should, yeah. I think I th- probably we could. Well, yeah. I think we'll need to. First, we need the Sherpas, but I think they're hireable. Well, and then, then we need a TARDIS. Ah, I'll take care of that part of it. <laughs> See to it, will you, Doctor? I will, I will. Ah. Uh. Well, we had promised to talk about the ebb and flow of Sherlock Holmes. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, what is that anyway? And and we've I think we've discussed this before that every generation seems to have its Sherlock Holmes. And and look, the, the books have never been out of print. The sixty stories hmm. which which began publication in eighteen eighty seven in Beaton's Christmas annual with a study in Scarlet. Uh, all the way through the final installment, which I think Arthur Conan Doyle finished in 1927. Yes, 27. Right. Not mistaken, in the collection known as the Casebook of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Forty years worth of Sherlock Holmes coming out on a fairly regular basis. There's a little bit of a a gap in there in between, but people could count on Sherlock Holmes stories coming out faithfully. For 40 years. Mm. And then, of course, the um, – oh, and, and, and they've never been out of print since then. Mm. Uh, the stories have, have remained in print all around the world and in many languages, as Don Hobbs told us on episode 64 when we went through his international collection. Um, however, when you look at the media interest in Sherlock Holmes, and you can do this a couple of ways – one is if you go on to Google's Ngram server. Have you have you played around oh, with, yeah, with sure. Ngram at all? Yeah. How how would you describe Ngram to the casual listener? Well, Google, you know, have acquired so much data through so much of their business through the interactions of people who use their services and who communicate on the network. And also they've had a mass digitization effort underway. That has benefited, by the way, folks like us in things like uh, Sherlock Holmes in the newspapers, uh, you know, volumes one or two, the ability to now have all those newspapers scanned and to be able to go back and see for the first six months of 1893 what um, Conan Doyle was up to and what Holmes was up to. So all of this information about uh, what was published when and what appeared in what newspaper and inside of books, the terms that were used in books, they now have the ability to go back and, and chart word usage and topic presence based on their particular point in time. So you can see the ebb and flow or the, you know, the, it's sort of like a wave, the up and down wave of certain topics in, in public literature. So if you want to know, for example, when, you know, you go to, go to that particular site and type in bubblegum and you'll see, the degree to which uh, it was in popular culture and uh, in terms of word usage and and depth and presence and things like that. Yeah, and I don't know if this is default on everyone's browser, but when I go to books.google.com slash ngrams, that's N-G-R-A-M-S, books.google.com slash ngrams, the Google Books ngram viewer pops up and it's pre-populated. Uh, it, it says, graph these comma-separated phrases between 1800 and 2000 from the Corpus English with a smoothing of three in this case. And the pre-populated comma-separated phrases are Albert Einstein, Sherlock Holmes, and Frankenstein. So Google's already done us a great service of uh, – of, of of, of determining how popular Sherlock Holmes was during that time. And if you look at the graph, um, Frankenstein starts in the early uh, 1800s uh, and, and begins kind of a, a moderate ramp up until 
Oh, gosh. It looks like the late 60s, early 70s, and we see a spike in Frankenstein. Of course, you don't see any mention of Albert Einstein before 1920 or so. Uh, maybe maybe in the, in the 1915, 1916 era when he began publishing. And then moving over to Sherlock Holmes, you see um, right along our timeline, 1888 or so uh, in books – and and this wonderful curve and and it starts to rise and comes down a little bit uh, in uh, in in the early 1900s that would be during the hiatus and we begin to see an increase after 1910 kind of levels out for a while and then peaks around 1930 1931 drops again um, and then it's all over the place in the 40s and 50s and then this huge spike of interest in the 70s. And uh, similar kind of micro expressions in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So you'll see this, and it's not it's not always uh, the same pattern, um, but you'll see a waxing and waning, an ebb and flow of interest in Sherlock Holmes over that time. Hmm. And I think one of the things we wanted to discuss here is what what are the factors behind that, and and how does that affect uh, fandom? or uh, devotees, or whatever you want to call it, people that are interested in the topic, and what can we expect in the years ahead? Yeah. I remember I, you, some year, a couple of years ago, there was uh, the Sherlock Holmes debate when the BBC series first started. Um, we did an online Sherlock Holmes debate against these two propositions. One, basically, the proposition was, as I remember it, which does more for the popularity of Sherlock Holmes, hmm. the Robert Downey Jr. Jr. film or, because at that point I think there was just one film, or the BBC Sherlock. Hmm. And I was asked on our behalf to join that debate on, this, on the topic of, oh, the film, definitely the film. Um, so part of my argument was I generated a slide with that Sherlock engram and made the point, hmm. um, you know, which was a useful debating point, although I must admit I don't particularly believe it. But the point was that you can um, chart the interest in Holmes rising and falling based on films, which are the biggest reach for a mass audience. And so you could see... You know, the Gillette film, you could see the private life, you could see 7% solution, you could see et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. But that's not really the case, I don't think. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not the fact that the films are the generator of interest. I think the films are representative of a resonance in popular culture and a, and a rediscovery mm. of poems at particular times. And certainly if you look at the my memory of that engram, if you look at that engram, you'll see that there was a big burst, I think, as you just said, in Holmesian popularity around 1930, which, of course, was because of the death of Conan Doyle. Well, that's a good point. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that as the the one thing that might set people off, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, is the first year that uh, the... the um, I guess it was two volumes at the time that the sh the complete Sherlock Holmes appeared in print. So yeah, the you, double the double day. You mean yeah? Yeah. Well, John, so, John Murray had didn't Murray already had out the. Murray of course, made, Murray broke it up, didn't he? The, the Murray Company broke it up into the long stories and the short stories. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But you saw this rise beginning in late 1925, 1926 of a you know that that's the uphill slope of the curve. Uh, and, and it hits its peak around uh, 1930, 1931. Uh, so again, this, these are these are phrases in print and in, in books, not necessarily in the news, right? Which is the focus of our friends um, uh, Matthias uh, Bostrom and Matt, Matt right. on the Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the newspapers. Um, but I'm sure that they're going to follow, or or they're going to find a very similar uptick. Around particular years, and and they'll probably see a dip in the in the hiatus years as well. However, um, you know, if if we look at let, let's take 1900 to 1920 
uh, as one. Kind of a steady up curve, but those are the years in which William Gillette was really doing his thing, um, mostly on the stage in the early 1900s. Uh, but, of course, he portrayed Sherlock Holmes some uh, 1,300 times or so over the course of his career from 1899 through 1930, was it? Yeah, and, possibly, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the film, having come out in 1916, that would have added a little bit uh, of, um, of interest as well. And at that point, um, we really didn't see Sherlock Holmes uh, leave the silver screen for any appreciable stretch of time because uh, the Eileen Norwood films began in 1922 and continued through the mid-20s. Uh, and then in the late 20s, Clive Brook, early 30s, Arthur Wantner. So then that would go through the mid 30s. So really, you just had this, this sustained barrage of Sherlock Holmes in popular culture between print and stage and film, which were the predominant forms of media at the time. Mm. And there, there seemed to be a continued demand because we, we move right from Arthur Wantner in 19, I think 1936 was his last one, 35 or 36. And then 39 is when Basil Rathbone picked up. Mm. Well, you know, there are, I think there are a number of factors at work here. One is the proliferation of media. You know, so as one new medium comes on the scene, there generally begins a drive for more things to put on it. And so radio comes, and eventually somebody says, well, you know, we could put the Sherlock Holmes story on radio. And so the stories come out on radio. And then television, oh, well, I guess we can put it on television. And now there are talkies, and so you put it up in the silver screen, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why there are Sherlockian video games and I'm presuming any moment, uh, you know, alternate reality kinds of things. Sherlock Go. Where is, uh, where is uh, Moriarty Go and Sherlock Go to go with Pokemon Go? <laughs> uh, well, you know, we recently had a, um, we recently had a review of a, uh, an animated cartoon uh, that Rob Nunn did for us on the site. Uh, Sherlock Holmes in the 23rd century. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, which is not to be confused with Sherlock Holmes in the 22nd century. Uh, it was just a, a fascinating glimpse at a couple of episodes in a, a, a different series uh, that he pulled out there. So, they, you know, talked about a essentially a time-traveling Sherlock Holmes. Not, not an intentionally time-traveling Sherlock Holmes, but one that simply, uh, by happenstance, found himself... Uh, alive in the 23rd century. I hate it when that happens. Ah. <laughs> Would you want to do it the other way around? Find yourself alive in the 19th century? As long as, as, long as I can make sure I didn't get cholera, tuberculosis, or... Uh... Uh, but, you, you know, Sherlock Holmes' uh, popularity and media choices aside, what... What era do you think you'd, you'd like to live in if you uh, had the option? Oh, me? I am – I'm uh, – I'd be delighted – well, you know, it's, it's a it's – a, the, the answer depends on how uh, – on your, the balance you have between fantasy and reality. Right. I, I would be perfectly happy being at a cocktail party with Nick and Nora Charles. I'd love to be uh, in the 20s before the Depression – uh, somewhere between 1900 and 1926, or uh, you know, in in the, the 30s and the 40s, I I, res- I seem to resonate to those times. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. You know, looking at the um, the Jeeves and Wooster series. Oh yeah, uh, that Hugh Laurie and uh, Stephen Fry were in. That 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 nails it, right? It's it's the 20s and 30s, yeah. or even Poirot. You know, just uh, if, if you were well placed, it could be a happy time. And and like you, I could see myself bending elbows with Nick and Nora Charles. Yeah, I you know put on a dinner suit, go to the store club, hop in your Laganda, drive into the country. Uh, <laughs> sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but you know, but you see, all these things depend on the dividing line between fantasy and reality. You know, it's really great if you're uh, you know a reasonably well-educated white male. 
But if you're somebody who isn't a reasonably educated white male, horror is a female. That is true. Uh, or a minority, you know, your, ex- <laughs> your, your fondness for these experiences is likely to be just a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess my, my fantasy would be to be Nick Charles <laughs> or to be Bertie Wooster. Not sometimes. <laughs> well, the problem with being Nick Charles is you gotta be, you gotta have Nick Charles's liver and that can't be fun. <laughs> Uh, I, I'd, I'd bring three extra livers with me <laughs> because that's, that's what's required. Um, no, your, your, your point is well taken. So, so in thinking about that era though, when, when did the first Sherlock Holmes broadcast happen on radio? Do, do you know the year? Oh, well, we'd have to go back to Bert Cools. I'm pretty sure, uh, it was somewhere in the late, it goes back to the maybe well certainly the early 30s but maybe even maybe even longer than that yeah it could be that there's something that goes back you know to like an experimental broadcast in the late 20s or something like that there's got to be something in the late 30s in the early 30s i remember that had been a part of bert's lecture at the sherlock holmes society of london all those years ago i don't remember if we got into that when we talked to no we we talked to him we talked to him primarily about uh, the bbc series yeah, yeah, we did. And and he he did look into the history of radio a bit, but I think it was uh it was British focused. Mm-hmm. Uh so it would have missed out any American productions that happened around that time. But I know Edith Miser was was writing for some of the radio shows in the 30s certainly. Uh so I I could see that in the late 20s that that might have crept uh back there. We'll have to check our our sources and um and determine that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about this trivia question? First appearance of Sherlock Holmes on television. Oh, well, I always think of uh, Ronald Howard, but that can't be right. There must be something before then. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, have to verify this, but I believe it was um, – I believe it was on an experimental – television show in 1937 crazy right yeah well yeah that would be interesting to know more about that you know the early days of television people tend to forget there were competing systems and technologies the the bell system in the united states did a demonstration in the late 20s um linking i think new york and washington and that basically used um a technology that wasn't too different than than a, a co- collection of fluorescent tubes comprising a screen uh, to show how an image might be broadcast from one point to another over copper. But uh, all kinds of goofy stuff happened in the early days of television. And then like there's the poor internet. old Philo Farnsworth. It, the internet was a series of tubes. <laughs> it still is, isn't it? <laughs> But yeah, you were saying Philo Farnsworth. He he lost the uh, yeah patent wars television that. battle, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Great name. Nobody's named Philo anymore. Why is that? <laughs> Philo Vance. Philo Mina. Um, <laughs> Philo Doe. <laughs> I'm just I'm checking my my source here. The television Sherlock Holmes, which was uh, published in conjunction with uh, the Granada series. Mm. I'm trying to see if they have – they don't seem to have a history here of Sherlock Holmes. It looks like it's focusing mostly on – Mostly on the movies of the 30s and 40s, and um, uh, looks like getting right into the production. It does say uh, the world's longest running series, what it calls Sherlock Holmes. Uh, of course, they mentioned Sherlock Holmes Baffled, the 1900 uh, short film. Oh, yeah. It was until October 1930. That the great detective was adapted for radio. Yeah. 
once again in America with William Gillette being the star of the NBC series, which began with Edith Miser's adaptation of The Speckled Band. So there you go. Here it is. It was in 1937, however, that Sherlock Holmes made his bow on television and began the record-breaking run, which shows no sign of coming to an end. Um, although John Logie Baird gave the first practical demonstration of black-and-white television on January 27, 1926, it was not until 10 years later, November 2, 1936, that the world's first public television service was inaugurated from the BBC station at Alexandra Palace in North London. Um, and it was a script for the three Garadubs hmm. that was uh, written by Thomas H. Hutchinson. And uh, there were two, two actors with a wealth of stage and radio work who were cast in the leading roles, Louis Hector as Holmes and William Podmore as Dr. Watson. Two of the Garadebs of the title, John and Nathan, were played by Arthur Maitland and James Spotswood. On the night of November 27, 1937, a little piece of Sherlockian history was made when the resulting production was broadcast for members of the American Radio Relay League. Unfortunately for us, the New York Times carried a report on this very first television dramatization of Sherlock Holmes. Of all stories, the Garadebs. I know, right? Why? Why would you choose that? Hmm. Uh, maybe, maybe it was still, uh, you know, hot in the public interest after having been one of the later publications. Who knows? Who knows? But that is from uh, Peter Haining's the television Sherlock Holmes. Hmm. So there, there, there we have the answer to that little conundrum. Hmm. So that that brings us to uh, the Rathbone era. Which obviously, you know, plenty of films, plenty of radio, but really after 46 or so, there was a kind of a dearth of Sherlock Holmes in popular media. Well, except, except for different appearances on TV, you know, even Rathbone, who said he would never play the character again, would pop up, I think, in the, certainly in the fifties, uh, on various programs putting on a deer stalker and having to do things with Milton Burrow and <laughs> Sinatra. Yeah. I think there's a clip I saw relatively recently where he's trying to help Frank Sinatra find his missing bow tie. The strangest thing. <laughs> I think I had seen that somewhere too. Um, I, I can't remember where. Uh, oh, I'm sure it's on YouTube. Some variety show or uh, a, a game show or something like that. Hmm. I don't know. Um, well, and then that leads us into the mid fifties when Ronald Howard, which you mentioned before, mm. took the role on in um, uh, on television, and Sherlock Holmes returned to the screen in nineteen fifty nine in his first color film, mm, The Hammer Hound. Yeah, and then that flows us nicely into the mid sixties with. Douglas Wilmer, and then Peter Cushing again um, through the late 60s. What do you think of the Wilmer films? Have you seen them? I have. I have some of them on DVD. Mm. I have what's available mm. on DVD. And a whole generation of Sherlockians in the UK grew up on Wilmer as Sherlock Holmes. And I could, I could see how he could be indelibly marked in, in their minds as their Sherlock Holmes. I, th I thought he gave a, uh, a, a very, very solid performance. He, he, he was less, mm, less of a caricature of Sherlock Holmes, less cardboard, less two-dimensional, if you will, and really brought some of the, um, the bristly nature of Holmes's personality to the uh, to the production, I thought. Mm. Have you seen them? Yeah, yeah, I've got the same DVDs. And what do you think? Well, my impression of them is colored by his anecdotes about what a shambles <laughs> the productions were, and his uh, his bafflement at being confronted by directors who didn't add any value, at scripts that were far too short, at 
language that wasn't appropriate for the time. He certainly seemed to be desperately sensitive to the fact that there were people who took the Holmesian canon very seriously, i.e. Mm-hmm. the, uh, of course, you know, that in 51, you had the, the Festival of Britain and the exhibition, the Abbey House exhibition, which re-sparked interest in Holmes. Um, and so he was very sensitive to the fact that unless you get the character right, you're just laying yourself open for a lot of criticism and worked hard to minimize that. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, his is not a portrayal I, I come back to with enjoyment. I'm, hmm. I'm, I'm happy to have them and I like to watch them, but, uh, I come back to enjoyment to the, you know, to the big films, to 7% Solution, The Private Life. Um, well, and, and in fairness, that, those films, that, you know, we're getting into the early 70s, Private Life in 1970, 7% Solution, uh, 75, 76. Mm-hmm. Um, those would have been in some of your formative Sherlockian years, No. Oh, well, you know, the 7% solution was just huge, absolutely huge. I mean, the fact that um, my, I remember seeing the 7% solution at Radio City Musical. Oh, wow. When they were still showing films at Radio City Musical. And, um, you know, it was just the fact that there would be this modern, gigantic f- production <laughs> of... Uh, Oh, no, wait a minute. Am I remembering that or am I remembering The Private Life? You know, I think I'm remembering The Private Life. It was The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes okay. that was at Radio City. And, um, you know, the fact that, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right around circa 1970. And that was just such a, uh, I mean, this was an environment where I still don't think we had seen The 39 Hound. You know, the the Rathbone Hound had been uh, held up and kept from distribution because of copyright and ownership issues, who knows. And so I had never seen The 39 Hound until that was released, I think, sometime in the 70s. Okay. Or maybe it was around the same time. But um, I remember traipsing to a movie theater. I think I went down to the Film Forum in Manhattan to see that. But it was absolutely huge to have this... uh, this, you know, this modern representation of Holmes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the and book, and Nick Meyer's book, you know, was just uh, unbelievably good. Yeah. And it, it, I don't think it can be understated, you know, the impact that that had. And we talked with Nick Meyer yeah. about this on um, one of our previous episodes. And, you know, you, you look at the, um, you, you look at the engram. That, that we mentioned, and again, there was this spike. Really, it started in in seventy and began to uh, to peak around nineteen seventy seven. Uh, Billy Wilder's Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, I think, spurred some of that on, and it probably spurred on Nick Meyer as as one of them. Um, you know, and it was just kind of this this one two punch going into the late seventies, and at, at that point, there's been kind of a sustained interest with little wobbles in the uh in 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 the graph ever since and really the next major thing was uh, i guess 79 murder by decree christopher Plummer, and then only another five years until the jeremy brett series debuted and that was good for about 10 years too of of sustained interest and um and, you know there, there will always be you know minor uh, appearances here and there, but you know these, these are the the icons of a generation, as it were. Mm. For me, Jeremy Brett was the first one that I ever saw, the, the one that colored my interest as I came to the books and simultaneously saw the series in the mid to late eighties. And to me, it was wonderful because the, the that series was reinforcing what I was reading in the books because of Granada's early faithfulness to many of the stories. Oh, yeah, I really agree. I mean, I go back to the Jeremy Brett. They, they've held up beautifully well. Those are the television programs I go back to with a lot of enjoyment. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the production broke down after a while, but 
uh, again, you, you saw this this explosion of interest in the Sherlockian world happen concurrently, or or with a slight delay. And 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 as all of these die down, we this is one of the things we talked about at Chautauqua um, in our panel discussion was every time that that tide comes in and then recedes, it leaves some remnants on the beach <laughs> of, of Sherlockians who remain behind driftwood of, <laughs> of the sea that remain rooted to the beach to uh, continue this discussion. And, and the argument in that panel discussion uh, from Stephen Doyle uh, was that he's seeing the current, you know, massive interest in Sherlock Holmes begin to recede. There, there is, uh, a, a degree of, you know, whether people are tired of, of the topic or whether we're oversaturated, which could be part of the case. You know, now we're, we're in the midst of, you know, we've had, uh, three, uh, was it two Robert Downey Jr. films with one more on the way, right? Well, I hope not. Is there really another one coming? There, I think there is. Mm-hmm. Um, we are now awaiting series four of the BBC and, Benedict Cumberbatch just earlier this week said after having completed series four, he could see how it would make a nice tidy ending. And of course there's fans that are in a panic now, but there are others that are saying, well, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to put it to bed. Well, maybe. And, yeah. And, and you've got elementary, which shows no signs of abatement going into its fifth season, uh, you know, continuing strong there. Uh, do you think we're do you think we're at maximum Sherlock at this point? Oh, I don't know, but it's got I don't know if this is the point, but I think certainly there uh you know these things are cyclical as as you pointed out in the whole title that we picked for today, the ebb and flow of Sherlock Holmes. These things, you know, go around. I mean, we are the human race seems to be um a race of people who just love story. Mm-hmm. And that's why the great stories just keep coming back. I mean, Les and, and uh, Laurie, when you talked to them, got into this a little bit. When you asked Les about, was there any other literature, you know, that inspired other writers? And he just said, oh, well, how about the Bible? And, uh, you know, his take on that was as uh, a collection of, of stories and morality that, that have had a profound and deep energizing effect on civilization. And those stories keep coming back. But also things keep coming back. Uh, it's interesting to think about what comes back and what doesn't come back. So, for example, if you look ahead, it's very hard to imagine that we are never going to see another movie about pirates. I mean, you know, Johnny Depp has pirated us all out. But at some point in the next 20 years... Some generation to come is going to rediscover the Jolly Roger and pirates. Um, it's hard to say, you know, there's never going to be another film about Robin Hood. You know, in the next 20 years, somebody's going to pop up and say, you know, it's time for – or The Lone Ranger. You know, even The Lone Ranger came back with Johnny Depp. Yeah. Uh, Westerns, Tarzan, things keep coming back. Where Holmes is unique is there's this rich body of literature underneath it the stories and um and so those tend to as you say you know never are never out of print i don't think it's possible to get uh through high school and college today without at least having s- some exposure to sherlock holmes you know in a literature course and then you think about what doesn't come back things that things that were really great but for some reason have never come back for example nick and nora well the stories, you know, I think um, it was uh, Rebecca Romney who talked about how disappointed she was in the actual book. Was it the Maltese Falcon, or she wasn't? Was she being critical of Hammett or somebody? Um, but but you know, the Thin Man, um, you know, is, there isn't really a great body of literature there. What makes those stories so terrific is the casting. You know, it's Myrna Loy, it's William Powell, it's the performances, it's the setting. You know, you think of things like, I mean, Fred and Ginger, you know, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I love seeing those pictures, 
But uh, and right now they've just opened on Broadway a new production, a, a new production, the first stage production I think of Holiday Inn. They've taken the Holiday Inn film, which had Crosby and Fred Astaire, and they've turned it into a Broadway musical. Huh. Nobody. Let me tell they, you something. It couldn't go more upscale, like Sheraton. Or Mer- <laughs> <laughs> well, they thought a lot about Hampton Court. <laughs> but I think there was some rights issues, but but you know, then well, it would have been it would have been medieval. So why, it would have been. So why you can imagine, you know, Ro- Robin Hood and pirates and these things sort of coming back again and again and again. I don't think anybody who dances like Fred Astaire is going to come back anytime soon. Well, uh, the good news for you is that in 2017 uh, we will be treated to Pirates of the Caribbean, oh. a Dead Men else. <laughs> <laughs> no. You are you are very prescient in your predictions, sir. Oh, another one. You know, um, and Frankenstein and the Wolfman and Dracula. These are things that, you know, keep coming back. Yeah. Well, you know, I think they're all things that they just capture they capture the imagination. And even though Sherlock Holmes is closer to reality, one would hope, than Frankenstein or Dracula. Um, he still manages to capture the imagination. You know, it's it, one of, one of the original superheroes, and, yeah. and, and look, superhero franchises are going gangbusters now. Whether it's from the DC or the Marvel universe, um, those are always uh, in vogue as well. But the thing, the thing that really fascinates me, and just looking at this this engram, and again, this is this is not everything. This is a proxy, uh, but looking at Google Books engram. As you move from uh, mid '80s to the the present day, there's kind of a leveling off and and very little oscillation in those curves. Far less than we saw in earlier decades, where there were wild swings uh, of of, of um, you know spikes and troughs. Uh, so to me, that 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 re- reinforces your point there that there is a sustained interest of some sort. That's not quite as drastic as the uh, the droughts that we saw in years past. Mm-hmm. Well, I tell you, I, I, I'm curious about from a data side. I'm curious if the size of the pool has gotten bigger and therefore the variability mm. is reduced. In other words, if you think about the yeah. amount of printed material that might have existed in the world in 1930 and the amount of printed Let's say, forget about the word printed, the amount of analogous material that Google could be absorbing and searching and looking at today, you know, I have the, I could be completely wrong, but I have sort of the intuitive feeling that one would be a thimble and the other would be a bucket. Yeah. You know, there's just been, and so if in fact there's been this huge expansion, yeah. um, you know, one wonders if that would affect um, the levels. But I could be completely. Fanciful well, and wrong. Very well be. I mean, this this graph, uh, the n-gram graph, is done as a percentage of total. Uh, so uh, you know, obviously, you you can't compare absolute values. Um, but another thing, uh, just to fully disclose here, is that it only goes as far as 2008. Oh. So we're, we're we've that's the cutoff point where oh. uh, Robert Downey Jr. film uh, appeared, the first one, 2009. And then, of course, 2010 is Sherlock, and then I think 2011 was Elementary. So we're missing a whole subset of oh, data well. books that I'm sure have been written as a result of those movies having been out well, and, and shows. What is Google doing to get moving here? Uh, you know, <laughs> launching hardware. Oh, they're making a spectacle of themselves. <laughs> Would you? Know, that's Snap. Oh, that's Snap. I get them so oh, confused. Snap. Snap. Well, why don't you dial up Larry and Sergey and ask him to get on it? I'll see what I can do. Well, this seems the perfect opportunity to hear from our friends at the Baker Street Journal. What's the purpose of the Baker Street Journal? It calls itself an irregular quarterly of Sherlockiana, but it's become much more. It tries very hard to accomplish a number of goals with every issue. First and foremost, it publishes articles of Sherlockian scholarship. These have ranged from the short and silly 
to the long and ponderous that covered every aspect of Holmes and Watson and their world. Second are articles and columns about happenings in the Sherlockian world and Sherlockian happenings in the world. Third are brief mentions of books and other items received. This continues the tradition of the Baker Street inventory begun by Edgar Smith to quickly highlight new additions to the ever-growing bibliography of books about Sherlock Holmes. And finally, the journal records the doings of the Baker Street Irregulars and its members. Should the journal be engaging in more of a dialogue with its readers? Possibly. But the world of electronic correspondence of special interest chat groups and 24-7 tweets makes an irregular quarterly seem rather elephantine and cumbersomely slow in its response. That's not to say it wouldn't welcome articles refuting, denying, confounding, or even eviscerating those which have gone before. That would prove that subscribers are actually reading, and that all passion for Sherlockian argument isn't spent in cyberspace. Perhaps someday, even this journal will have an electronic presence. The Baker Street Journal cannot return to the days when the entire canon was unexplored and the rules of the game were waiting to be written, but it does its best to both emulate and stimulate such emotional and intellectual excitement. See what it's all about at BakerStreetJournal.com. Ah, those yellow covers. <laughs> With what delight I find them in my mailbox. All right, well, that's the sound, of course, of the news. Uh-oh. There have been a few things in the in the news lately that are worth covering, I think. Yes. Items of note since uncovering. we... Uncovering. We uncover them. Uh, and that's, that's true. That is, we, we rip the covers off and uncover them as we cover them. Um, and it's been a while since we've covered news here, so a few things have happened. Uh, maybe a little farther back on the calendar, but we thought they're worth mentioning here. Uh, the first, of course, is the uh, the sad passing of Mr. Gene Wilder, mm. who, of course, played Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother. And uh, again, this was in the 1970s, back when you know that, that that's how you knew things were at a peak, is because a parody could come out and. Uh, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a great film, but I still enjoy watching it, if not for uh, the, the ridiculousness of Madeline Kahn or the uh, the manic episodes of Gene Wilder uh, and, and um, you know, uh, his his sidekick there, Marty uh, Feldman. Marty Feldman. Yeah. And, and, of course, who could forget Leo McKern as Professor Moriarty? Well, and Dom DeLuise as... Uh, oh, that's right, yes. As the uh, Signor Gambetti, the opera singer. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the things I picked up early on when I first saw that film, I recall, is the very clever naming of of Sharonford Holmes' assistant. You, you remember what his name was in that? No. Marty Feldman's name? Uh, no. Orm- Ormond Sacker. Oh, right. Ormond Sacker. That's exactly right. The original name of Watson. Exactly. Yeah. And, of course, Sharonford Holmes was the original name for Sherlock Holmes. Right. You could see that in the original manuscript for A Study in Scarlet. Right. So. The, the notes. Yeah. So well, I think it was it was lovingly done. It was done, uh, you know, it, it was one that Wilder wrote and directed. And he obviously had some very good working knowledge of the Sherlock Holmes canon. I like them very fond of the movie, and I don't own a copy of it. It's hard to find these days, but I'd something whenever I see it, I enjoy seeing it. Indeed, I think you can you can find it on YouTube, but I think it is out on DVD now. Oh, really? Oh, good. So, well, and in keeping with that theme of you know, have we reached peak Sherlock? Uh, and and potentially yes, because there is another parody movie that is in the making now, with none other than Will Ferrell. <laughs> And John C. Riley uh-huh. at Holmes and Watson. It's going to be directed by uh, Eaton Cohen. Uh, so we'll we'll see exactly what that looks like. I, I 
I don't know too many people that are thrilled with the idea of Will Ferrell applying his comedy chops to Sherlock Holmes. Is this a Coen Brothers film? Um, it doesn't say the brothers. It just says uh, Ethan Coen. Because I love their films. But, uh, well, we'll have to see what happens. I, I, I can't fathom. Well, you know, my memory of all the Sherlockian comedies is that they just weren't very funny. Yeah. Even uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and uh, John Cleese and uh, how about Michael Caine and Ben Kingsley? Well, I was very, I'm very fond of them as actors. But if somebody told me, I'm sorry, you know, you could never see that film again for as long as you live, I, I, st- I, I wouldn't have any trouble getting to sleep tonight. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I vague, I bear, the nicest thing about that film, I think, was the, is the caricature that Tom Richmond did of Kane as uh, Holmes. That is. And I have the original pencil sketch that came along with that. Yeah, I know you know. Limited edition. Yeah. One of my favorites. What else do we have in the news? Well, there's a wonderful game. Um, that I've looked at that has been a – has that been a Kickstarter kind of a project? was a Kickstarter, yeah. Moriarty's Web, is it closed now? It, it has closed. We, uh, we jumped in at the last minute. I think there were five days to go, and they still had, oh, gosh, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars to, uh, to make, maybe 5000 something along those lines. And uh, – it wasn't completely due to us, but we had some hand in it. We put it over the top. Oh, good. Put it over the top. They they exceeded their goal. Um, I think the uh, th- yeah, 375 backers pledged twenty five thousand dollars to help bring this project to life. Um, it's a really neat board game because it's it's one that you kind of build as you go, and you try and make your way across London, and it's it's. Uh, three-dimensional in nature in that there are little things to collect, little pieces, and uh, there are uh, cards and characters and all the rest. So it should be, should be pretty interesting. And we think it may be out in time for the holidays. Yeah, I was impressed with the design of it. Very much so, yeah. Uh, and that, that was done by Lucy Kiefer. Mm. And... Uh, and her family, her her sister, and her father, her father who has uh, evidently has a uh, a career in the board game industry. So uh, that that's what happens when you uh, when you have a daughter who's a Sherlockian and you're a board game creator. Well, <laughs> you will be co opted to create a Sherlock Holmes board game. <laughs> so, but uh, you know the the video and 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 the game and everything about it seemed like it was very well done. So I'm looking forward to trying that out. Oh, well, what else do we have here? Uh, well, it looks like it looks like um, there's a, a fantastic article uh, from our friends at Inverse uh, claiming that the first modern fandom was responsible for bringing Sherlock Holmes back from the dead. And that that was basically the birth of fandom. Huh. And without Sherlock Holmes, we would not have Comic Con. So it's, it seems like a stretch of the imagination, but as they pick it up and how the public reacted to Sherlock Holmes, um, Sherlock Holmes' death, and and people assaulting Conan Doyle verbally and in in writing, uh, they claim that that is what helped to bring. Sherlock Holmes back from the grave. I'm sure those hefty checks from the Strand magazine had <laughs> nothing to do with it. No, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Well, you know, that's been I'm I'm just I'm for such a long while I accepted without hesitation the idea that people wore black armbands to mark to mourn the passing of Sherlock Holmes. And that appears to be completely anecdotal and have no basis in fact. Uh, yeah. At least according to people who've dug into it, um, it would be interesting to get a better sense of exactly what the public reaction was to the final problem. Um, well, I'll bet we will get some of that in the 
I don't know if it's the next volume, but it'll be a volume pretty yeah. soon. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, and the newspapers. Yeah, some future volume. Yeah. Yeah, we'll check that out. And speaking of another volume to check out, we mentioned in episode 99 with Christopher Redmond that uh, he had a number of books in the making, and one of them, if you recall, was a fascinating concept called About 60. You remember him talking about that one? Yes, I do. Yeah, where he asked an interesting collection of authors to make the case that their particular Sherlock Holmes story that they'd selected was the best. Mm. And he had a very nice caveat there. If you can't make a case that it is actually the best, perhaps you can make the case that it's the best of its kind. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty smart. It was. It was. Well, that that book is now for sale. Oh. You can find that at uh, the Wild Side Press for fourteen ninety nine. Uh, I, I hope we'll be able to get our hands on a copy and see just how these folks went about their assignment and who who wins the prize for the most creative essay. <laughs> it's got to be somebody with one of the really, really horrible stories. Yeah, I wonder who took the lion's mane. <laughs> uh, slippery as it is. Well, I think that wraps up. Wraps up the news. And if you're looking to get in touch with us, there are a myriad number of ways to do that. Oh, we uh, don't still ask people to do that, do we? No, we try. Mm. We try, you know. Oh, but before we do that... Mm -hmm. Ah, always a good feeling. Always a good feeling when we can release some of that gas. Well, we have, uh, we've talked here about, uh, the waxing and waning of Sherlock Holmes. And in, in that, our little, our little empire here is called I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. We thought it was appropriate to delve into the Autumn 2000 issue of the Baker Street Journal, volume 50, number three. We are all guilty of saying, perhaps far too often, that we hear of Sherlock everywhere. I've begun to wonder if we aren't looking at it the wrong way. It's not so much that we hear of Sherlock everywhere as that, to a Sherlockian, all things are Sherlockian. Having made the canon part of our very being, we shouldn't be surprised that, for us, every little breeze seems to whisper, Holmes. Oh, Every little lock sings of Sherlock. Take, for instance, oh, this exchange from Anthony Powell's A Question of Upbringing. The buildings are nice, he used to say, but not the undergraduates. Well, what do you expect undergraduates to be like? Keep bullpups and drink brandies and soda? Huh, they won't do as they are. Now, this conversation sounds terribly right to a Sherlockian, just as we know about dogs in the nighttime and that there are 17 steps to Baker Street and that it's always 1895, we also know that undergraduates have bull terriers and that all over England, men are keeping bull pups. Recently, we spotted a single crutch propped up near a park bench. It was, of course, aluminum. It was obviously a singular affair, an outside of lords, any abandoned crutch would seem to be a mystery. Oh, we pretend to marvel at the way the popular culture has consumed Holmes and made him an avatar for all things rational and ratiocinative. But in our canonized souls, we know that such tribute is only right. We must accept, as his creator never could, that Holmes has an existence that is quite literally right out of our minds. We've all thought about him for so long and so deeply that it's as if he truly walks among us. The world has become a place that always resonates for us of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Some nerve, as if he walks. Um, some nerve. Well, 
Steve wrote that Sherlock Holmes is right out of our minds, and <laughs> so are we. <laughs> or should be. Yeah, that's very good. I like that. Yeah, very well done. So we were saying about getting in touch with us. Oh, uh, no, we weren't. Reach out and touch us. Uh, I th- well, you know, we're so quiet and shy. Folks, forget about it. We're just, oh, all right. Look, give us a call. If you call us at 774-221-READ, that's 774-221-7323, we will automatically record your comments and hopefully, possibly, play them on the program. Or, if you don't like that, if the immediacy of leaving a voicemail for us is just too disturbing to you, send us an email, comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Or go to Facebook, go to Tumblr, go to Twitter, for all the good it'll do you. And we're there at I Hear of Sherlock. So it's Facebook.com, I Hear of Sherlock, and I Hear of Sherlock.tumblr.com. We're every place, and we just we just want to hear from you. We want to hear from you, and uh, let us know what you think and what you'd like to see and hear. And leave us a review on iTunes. That's important. Yeah, that is important. Go to go to bitly slash I hear of Sherlock. That's b i t dot l o i I hear of Sherlock, all lowercase. And then the iTunes app will pop open, and you'll be given an opportunity to. Shut us off. But to write a review after you've stopped playing the show, because yes. we want your attention focused. We want your attention focused on that that fifth star and that review that just comes right out of your mind. <laughs> so don't leave us wondering out of our minds whether we'll get a review from you. Make it happen, folks. And, of course, if you like what you hear here and you would like to help support the show, if you didn't get in on that Kickstarter, get in on Patreon. Patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock or that orange button right on our site. Donate whatever you can afford. A dollar an episode, five dollars an episode, ten dollars an episode. Let your mind wander. Let your checkbook wander. <laughs> right on over to Patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. Well, I believe... We are done verbally wandering around this episode, if I'm not mistaken. Woohoo! Ah, I know you're not as excited as our listeners, ah. or as our listener. <laughs> well, that leaves me only one thing to say, and that is I am Scott Monty. Yes, and I am Bert Wolder. And together we say... The, the Games... games. Oh, fuck! I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck. And believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.